questions. Question orale, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General can't get his story straight when it comes to judicial appointments. First, the process was independent. Second, they only interfered to get more diverse candidates. We then heard that the government didn't always take the most highly recommended candidate. Mr. Speaker, when answers continually change, it suggests bad actions are being covered up. Will the Prime Minister finally admit that he has politicized Canadian judicial appointments? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to taking uh, questions from the member opposite, but uh, first I want to reassure Canadians that the Canadian government uh, is watching very carefully events unfold in the United States uh, as they go through their electoral processes. As always, we will uh, seek to uh, make sure that we're able to defend Canadian interests uh, and Canadians uh, as we move forward, as the Americans uh, make an important decision uh, about uh, uh, the next steps forward. Uh, we will watch. We will continue to defend Canadians. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, another sign of a cover-up is giving statements like that or answering questions that were never actually asked, Mr. Speaker. The Attorney General told this House he never had a candidate refused by the Prime Minister's office. Nobody asked him that question, Mr. Speaker. If you're told who to select, your selection will never be refused, Mr. Speaker. Has the Prime Minister or anyone in his office ever directed the Attorney General to pick a certain candidate. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, after 10 years of Conservative mismanagement, we brought in important reforms to the process in 2016. We strengthened the role of the independent judicial advisory committees. We produced a more rigorous, open and accountable system that better reflects Canada's diversity. All appointments are based on merit and based on the needs of the court and each candidate's area of expertise. We are proud of the high quality of jurists that have been appointed under our reformed system. They are from different backgrounds and, yes, even from different political affiliations. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. the President, beaucoup. Mr. Speaker, a number of members in the Prime Minister's entourage are influencing appointments. Emails between PMO and the former Justice Minister are evidence today of this. Obviously, there's been interference. Is the Prime Minister's office influencing the appointment of judges? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have made major reforms to the process in 2016 after 10 years of mismanagement under the Conservative government. We strengthened the role of the Advisory Committee, which is independent, their role in appointments. We also set up a stricter, more open and accountable system that better reflects Canada's diversity. Appointments are based on merit, as well as on the needs of the courts in various fields of expertise. We are very proud of the appointments we've made since this new strengthened system was put in place. There's more variety and more political stripes to the appointments. The Honourable Opposition Leader. Stats on the second wave of COVID-19 are increasingly worrisome. Public Health is now recommending the wearing of three-layer masks instead of two-layer masks. Clearly, clearly Public federal, health, federal public health is stricter than in Quebec. Should Quebecers listen to the federal orders or the provincial orders? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since the beginning of this, outset, uh, this pandemic, we've been working with the provinces and territories to ensure Canadians are protected from coast to coast. We have always recognized the importance of workers, uh, frontline workers and local authorities in managing the pandemic properly within their regions. At the federal level, we recommend measures that could be helpful across the country. We hope everyone will do whatever they can to keep their distances, to protect themselves and others by wearing a mask and by charging the COVID, uh, downloading the COVID alert app. That Canadians get consistent public health advice when it comes to COVID-19. And they didn't get that yesterday from the health minister. 
She refused to answer when asked if Canadians should listen to the federal, provincial or municipal health authorities when there's conflicting advice about lockdowns or mask wearing. In fact, on those issues, she's changed her own mind several times, Mr. Speaker. Why can't Canadians get a straight answer from the federal health minister when it comes to public health advice about COVID-19? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have been clear from the very beginning uh, that the need to do everything we can to keep ourselves and others safe uh, is what Canadians should be doing. I'm very pleased uh, to support Dr. Tam, Dr., uh, doc, uh, support the Health Minister, support uh, all of our various uh, health experts across the country who are putting forward measures that Canadians can take on to keep themselves safe. I'm extremely pleased to see here the member opposite it, the leader of the opposition, talk about the importance of wearing masks. It's important that everyone wears masks. The Honourable Member for Belle Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe that for a very rare occasion, the Prime Minister and I agree that the election of Joe Biden would be preferable. I will never be Prime Minister of Canada, so I can say so. He can't say so. He can't say so. But he did it anyway. He said that our relationship with the United States was weakened. Our, in fact, because he said so anyway, our relationship with the U.S. And is weakened, and so is our relationship with France because of what this Prime Minister has said. Has the Prime Minister spoken to the French President, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? First of all, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reassure everyone here in the House and all Canadians that we are closely watching events in the United States. And as we've done for years with success, we've always been there to defend Canadian interests, the interests of our entrepreneurs, our workers, be they aluminum or steel workers. We will remain there, regardless of the result of the U.S. election, to defend Canadians. And we will continue to work with all our allies, including France, on the major issues we face throughout the world. The Honourable Member for Belle et Chambly. Uh, that doesn't really answer the question. I'm satisfied that the Quebec Premier and we have made it clear to France that this Prime Minister does not speak for Quebec when it comes to freedom of expression, secularism, or friendship with France. But we're in an awkward situation at the same time with France and the U.S. right now. The French President called the Quebec Premier, but not the Prime Minister of Canada, and that shows that there's a chill between the two countries. There's only one solution. Will the Prime Minister of Canada phone the French president and apologize for his woeful lack in judgment? The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I have been very happy to work with my friend, President Macron of France, on issues that are important to Canadians and for the entire planet, whether it's climate change, women's rights, fighting terrorism, or upholding our fundamental rights. We will always do this, and I will be delighted to speak to President Macron in the near future. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're full into the middle of the second wave of COVID-19. Once again, our seniors are the hardest hit. It's unacceptable. It was unacceptable during the first wave, but it's completely unforgivable in the second wave. Our seniors deserve the best possible care. The Prime Minister promised to create federal care standards. Where are those standards to protect our seniors? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand on this side of the House how important it is to work in partnership with the provinces on protecting all Canadians, particularly our seniors who are vulnerable to COVID-19. And that is why we immediately, when Quebec asked for them, we sent in our armed forces and we continue to work with the Red Cross because we will always be there for our seniors. In addition, we're working with the provinces to share best practices and to ensure that seniors will indeed be protected in long-term care all across the country for the years to come. Mr. Speaker, the worst outbreak of COVID-19 right now is happening in Manitoba. It's happening in long-term care homes, and it's happening in long-term care homes owned 
by this government. These are for profit. When we've said again and again, profit should have no place in the care of our seniors and that we need national standards to care for our seniors. So when will the Prime Minister take responsibility and profit in the federally owned long-term care homes and save lives? Full Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, Canadians expect all their orders of government to work together. We fully respect provincial jurisdiction over long-term care homes, but we are there to support. We're working with them towards long-term uh, long care uh, norms and guidelines uh, that can be national in scope to make sure that no senior anywhere in the country can feel like they're getting less protection than their neighbours in a different, uh, different part of the country. We need to be there to support. I spoke with Premier Pallister of Manitoba last night and continued to encourage uh, him to reach out to the federal government for anything he needs to handle uh, this difficult situation. Honorable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Shikurimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, for Canadians, freedom of expression is fundamental and non negotiable. Recently, the Prime Minister didn't really know what to do. On Friday, he said what he really thought, but then he withdrew his remarks because he realized that neither the French nor Canadians agreed with him. Mac Macron has basically slapped the Prime Minister across the face by calling the Premier of Quebec and not him. I'd like to know from the Prime Minister why hasn't President Macron called him the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, as I said last week, and I repeat today, we will always defend freedom of expression. It's a right, a freedom that's protected under the Charter and is something that we hold dear and we will protect it in our democracy and society. As usual, we will continue to work with our counterparts around the world, including President Macron, on issues that are important to Canadians and everyone else in the world, including defending freedom of expression and other fundamental rights. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, I'd like the Prime Minister to think a little bit about this. On Friday, he said that freedom of expression was not unlimited. But yesterday, he said, we vigorously defend freedom of expression. That's obviously two different versions, and that can't be denied. We see the Prime Minister as someone who doesn't know which way to turn. Why can't he admit that what he said last Friday was what he truly thinks about freedom of expression? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my colleague, I'm sure, wouldn't want to mislead the House. Perhaps he should, I should rectify things by saying that I did say last Friday that we would always defend freedom of expression. That is an essential principle of our democracy. It's a fundamental freedom that we hold dear as Canadians, and we will always defend that here and elsewhere in the world. And Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, Professor Charlebois from Dalhousie University described the practices of grocery giants as, and I quote, supply chain bullying. He pointed to the fees charged by suppliers by grocery giants like Loblaws and Walmart to pay for $6 billion in home renovations to their stores. That's like making a multi-million dollar renovation on your cottage at Harrington Lake and expecting taxpayers to foot the bill. <laughs> When will this government tell Loblaws and Walmart to stop the bullying tactics that put farmers and food processors at risk and make grocery bills even higher for Canadians? Oh. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it is disappointing to see grocers impose costly fees which fall on thousands of Canadian food producers working hard to feed Canadians and support communities. Independent grocers, food processors, uh, food producers and workers have played a critical role during this pandemic. We share Canadians' concern about fair market practices and are committed to ensuring the right conditions for all businesses to thrive. The Federal Competition Bureau, as an independent law enforcement agency, is responsible for enforcing the Competition Act, uh, and we expect that it will. Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister should know that and take seriously that food security in a pandemic is a very real risk. 
Since March last of this year, Canadians have seen shortages of products on grocery store shelves. Producers and processors have stepped up and kept food coming from the farm to Canadians' tables, but the grocery giants are gouging them with new fees. After months of rising above the challenges with next to no support from this government, they need action now. When will the government recognize this service to Canadian families and stand up to the grocery giants' supply chain bullying? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. It is a shame to see members uh, uh, trying to mislead the House in the fact that this government has actually stepped up with hundreds of millions of dollars during this unprecedented time to support producers, to support farmers, to support people right across the country who are struggling in this pandemic. Yes, we are concerned with uh, the costly fees added on by uh, grocery chains, uh, and that's why we have turned to the Federal Competition Bureau. Uh, we we assure Canadians we will continue to raise this matter also with our provincial counterparts as we encourage everyone to take action in this matter. The Honourable Member for Carleton. In the year with the greatest spending in Canada's history, that we have no budget, no economic or fiscal update, no reports every two weeks on COVID spending. No mandate letter to the finance minister, and today the parliamentary budget officer has condemned the government for its secrecy around billions in spending. Does the prime minister have any secrets to hide about spending, or has he simply lost count? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our absolute priority is to support Canadians and businesses as we go through this COVID-19 pandemic. Since the very outset, we have been open and transparent about our economic plan for COVID-19, and we'd like to thank all parties for cooperating in the rollout of that funding and for their support in this unprecedented period. Since the beginning, we have given frequent updates and in keeping with our ongoing commitment, we have presented, we will be presenting more information this fall, and we will always be there for Canadians when they need us. We don't know. We don't know about the budget because there hasn't been one in a record 18 months. About an economic update, which doesn't yet have a date, there's still no a letter of mandate to the Minister of Finance, no bi weekly updates. The parliamentary budget officer says there's no reports on $80 billion of spending. You know, Napoleon said never ascribe to malice what can be explained by incompetence. So, is it possible that the Prime Minister is not hiding anything? He's just completely lost track of all the spending. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this pandemic, we made a very different decision than what the Conservatives would have made, as uh, the member from Carleton keeps highlighting. We made a commitment to Canadians that we would be there for them. We sent out the Canada Emergency Response Benefit almost immediately to millions of Canadians who needed it, who used it to put groceries on the table, to pay for their rents, to support their families at a time of uncertainty and crisis. We had Canadians' backs, and we will continue to have Canadians' backs as long as it takes whatever it takes. I will let the Conservatives continue to try and play politics and explain how they wouldn't have done that for Canadians, but we have and we will continue to. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, French President Emmanuel Macron phoned the Quebec Premier to thank him for his unconditional support for freedom of expression. The Prime Minister of Canada's phone didn't ring because he said you have to put limits on this freedom. But in a dramatic twist, he changed his mind. He now says we must always defend freedom of expression. So who knows whether he's going to change his mind again. Why did it take such a diplomatic snub for him to understand that you have to defend freedom of expression when it's attacked by an is Islamic fundamentalist killer? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the opposition parties are trying to make political hay out of nothing, but it's very clear what I said on Friday. We will always defend freedom of expression. There's no nothing equivocal about it. It's unambiguous. We will stand up for Canadians' fundamental rights. We will always be there to support our friends around the world who are facing atrocious, unacceptable crimes. We will always 
defend the fundamental values and principles of all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, I guess everyone misunderstood what he was saying, including President Macron. Europe is experiencing a worrying resurgence of Islamic extremist terrorism with three deadly attacks in the past two weeks. Canada should be a dependable, reliable and steadfast ally to our European partners against obscurantist killers. But that's not what the Prime Minister was last week. His flip-flops on freedom of expression make him look like a wishy-washy leader who can't make up his mind between condemning violence and uh, trying to reassure a radical Islamic fringe. Why is it so hard for him to say there's no circumstance under which religion can serve to justify violence? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to encourage my honourable colleague to take a look at what I said last week. I said we would always defend freedom of expression. I said we condemned unequivocally those acts which were unjustified and unjustifiable and unacceptable. I said we would not allow the, commu the Islamic community to be defined by these violent extremists. That's precisely what I said last week, and I will repeat it this week. The opposition. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the facts on COVID-19, the government has three stories on the pandemic warning system. The health minister has said it was shut off, and they're investigating that decision. The prime minister has said the warning system was never shut off. The public safety minister just confirmed it was shut off, but he didn't find out about it until we started asking questions. Which one of these stories is true? <laughs> Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, there have been no changes in funding or staffing levels uh, in that organization since 2015. We've continued to rely on experts and public servants uh, to do the work they continue to do. Indeed, when reports came out, the health minister asked to follow up on some uh, questions that were being posed, and we are actually following up on that right now. We have always put science at the forefront of our decision making. We were acting and, and reacting to this pandemic from the beginning of January. We will continue to do whatever is necessary to keep Canadians safe through the rest of the time we're dealing with this pandemic. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister just said there were no changes to a system that two of his ministers said was shut down, Mr. Speaker. There's consequences to shutting down our early pandemic warning system. The New York Times revealed that the World Health Organization handed key parts of the early work on COVID-19 over to China. A global health expert has referred to this as an absolute whitewash. Why did this government muzzle Canadian officials only to rely on Communist China for early news on the COVID outbreak? Oh. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on January 2nd, Dr. Theresa Tam convened a meeting of her provincial counterparts to talk about worrisome news coming out of China. Uh, weeks later, uh, we gathered the incident response group at the cabinet level uh, to talk about this development, and we continued to engage uh, with scientists and doctors from around the world, including at the WHO, including our own internal capacities, uh, to prepare and respond to this pandemic. We've learned many things since then, Mr. Speaker, and we'll be better positioned in the future. But as it is, we will continue to do everything we can, as we have, to protect Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the the public safety minister told committee he wasn't aware of anyone asking to close the border until days before they closed it. The Prime Minister just confirmed he was warned on January 2nd by Dr. Tam, and we now know that in February, officials at public safety were sending notes to government departments warning about the transmission risk of Canadians returning from abroad. Why did the Prime Minister ignore warnings from his own public safety officials for over a month? before he closed the border. Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every single step of the way, we leaned on experts and epidemiologists and international uh, health uh, experts in the pandemic uh, for the best recommendations on how to keep Canadians safe. We move forward on those, including setting up quarantine facilities for Canadians returning, bringing in extra measures at the borders, and we were able to see uh, in those early days a very low incidence of cases uh, in Canada. Now, there are many things we're going to be looking back on and say, oh, we should have done this differently. 
differently, should have done that differently. But I can tell you, every effort was made to do everything right, and Canadians are benefiting from those decisions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker. Point of order. Madame Chabot. I didn't hear the question or the answer, Mr. Speaker. Okay, is the interpretation... Okay, nous allons voir. We'll see, there may be a technical problem. Okay, uh, je vais parler en anglais. Okay, I'll speak in English. Is it translated into French? Est-ce que c'est tra est traduit en français? Is that being translated into French? Okay, parfait, je pense. Okay, great, I think we've solved the problem. And we'll go back to the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, as we all know, the second wave is hitting harder and harder. The lack of public health workers and the delayed decisions coming from this Liberal government since the very beginning of the pandemic have left Canadians confused about what advice to follow. Can Canadians still trust this government? And can we hope to have uh, a family Christmas this year, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Speaker, Canadians can continue to trust this government. We were there to support them from the very beginning of this pandemic, not just with health measures and support for the provinces, but also with direct support to Canadians, with the emergency benefits, with the wage subsidy, with benefits for seniors, for students, for young people. We will remain there for Canadians. We will all do our part. The federal government will continue to be there. We will continue to work with the provinces who are doing what they need to do, and Canadians are doing what they can do to lessen the impact. Liberals love their pretty words when it comes to gender equality, but women are still waiting. Women are waiting for affordable childcare. Women are waiting for equal pay. Canadian women still make 32% less than men, and our work shouldn't come at a discount. After decades of inaction, the Liberals finally moved on pay equity. But today's PBO report shows the Liberals are dragging their feet and the law is not being enforced. Why do women still have to fight their own government for pay equity? Why do we still have to wait? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the fast, past five years, we've taken many significant steps forward towards gender equality, but we know there is much more work to do. We passed historic pay equity legislation and are working hard to implement it. We know that this is a systemic change that is long overdue. Uh, we have begun taking large steps towards it, but we will continue to work with all our allies in this House and beyond to ensure that we're making things much better in this country country. We need gender equality. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. That's why we will continue to work hard every day to achieve it. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Canada's largest federal infrastructure project is the Gordie Howe Bridge being built in my riding. The project will feature art representing the local history of the area. It will include European and Indigenous art, but will unjustly exclude the historic and extremely important black community. The, this very location was the epicenter of the Underground Railway for escaping slavery to freedom. African Canadians are being written out of our history by the Liberal government, a demonstration of systemic racism. Will the Prime Minister commit right now, today, to make sure he fixes this problem and he turns it around and includes the African Black Committee history? He can do it now. Do we have his commitment to make sure it gets done? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member opposite for his advocacy on this issue. It sounds uh, uh, like uh, something that absolutely we should be moving forward on. I look forward to uh, talking with the Infrastructure Minister and working with our, our first ever Minister for Diversity and Inclusion in the history of this country to ensure that we're doing everything we can to fight systemic racism, to uh, fight against anti-black racism, and uh, to make sure that we are properly remembering all aspects of our history because uh, black history is Canadian history, Mr. Speaker, not just in February, but every month. We will continue to work uh, together to make sure that we do that. The Honourable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, since the very beginning of this pandemic, businesses in my riding of Kingston and the Islands have counted on our government for the support they need to keep their employees on the payroll and keep their doors open. Now, as we face a second wave of the pandemic, many businesses are doing their part by following public health orders, but they are worried. 
worried about being able to make it through this pandemic. Can the Prime Minister tell this House what the government is doing to ensure businesses, in my riding, have the support they need to get through this second wave and are able to be in a strong position when we recover from this pandemic? Honourable, sorry, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member for Kingston and the Islands for his question and for his tremendous advocacy on behalf of workers and businesses in his riding. We will continue to support small businesses across the country who have been hard hit by this pandemic. With the new Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy, we will provide simple, easy-to-access rent support until 2021. And for those who are impacted by public health orders, we would make sure that they have additional supports to cover up to 90% of their rent. We're calling on all members of this House to help get the support to businesses across the country and make sure that it goes directly to tenants and not through landlords anymore. The Honourable Member for Charleswood St. James is in a boy Hedenley. Mr. Speaker, for weeks, Conservatives have been asking questions about Canadian drone systems that have been diverted to the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan in violation of international treaties. We know that on April 23rd, the Prime Minister spoke with the President of Turkey. Pictures of these drone systems have now appeared in the Globe and Mail. Canadians deserve answers. Did the Prime Minister agree to the Turkish President's request to approve these systems for export? Yes or no? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have a rigorous export control system that ensures that uh, as we export uh, uh, armaments or uh, military equipment around the world, uh, all the rules are followed. Uh, when reports came out of possible Canadian technology being used in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, we immediately suspended these export, the relevant export permits uh, to Turkey uh, and are following up on uh, an, uh, a, uh, an appropriate investigation. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian made equipment is not being used in illicit or, uh, or uh, ways that uh, uh, are not aligned with the original contract signed uh, and, of course, uh, never are used to harm civilians or innocents. The Honourable Deputy de Louis Saint The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, that was interesting, but that was not the question. And this is a serious question which deserves a clear answer. Canada developed a drone system. This same system was used in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which violates international accords. We know that on the 23rd of April, the Prime Minister spoke with the President of Turkey. The question is simple and deserves a clear answer. During that conversation, did the Prime Minister agree to the export and sale of Canadian drones to Turkey? Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Liberals' northern drilling ban has been holding back our economy since it was imposed in 2016. What's worse is that the government failed to uh, consult with their territorial partners before moving forward on this policy. As it is slated for review next year, and Canada's resource sector can play a pivotal role in our economic recovery, will the Prime Minister commit today to initiating the consultation with northerners that he neglected the first time around? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know how important it is to continue to develop our natural resources as we move forward into uh, a renewed and build back better future. Uh, we know that natural resources will play a key role in developing the technologies of the future from uh, mining products, to, uh, cobalt and lithium and other uh, nickel that goes into our batteries, to copper for our wiring, to uh, rare earth minerals for our high-tech systems. We know how important it is to move forward on natural resources, but we know we need to do it properly, and that is always in partnership with Indigenous peoples, with clarity uh, for industry, and with predictability for all. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, the Iqaluit Post Office is one of the busiest in Canada, as Nunavumiut must order many items online. As expected, the pandemic has boosted this demand, and it has actually flooded the post office with more than it can handle. Residents of Iqaluit have been calling on the government to make upgrades on this facility for a number of years. So can the Prime Minister explain why Nunavut continues to be underserved by his government? Well, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, after years of using uh, the North for photo ops by the previous Prime Minister, we have made historic investments in supporting communities of the North, recognizing that Northern sovereignty happens not with a few photo ops, but with real substantive investments in, uh, the, Cana in the Canadians, in people who live there. Uh, that is why we will continue to work in partnership uh, with Northerners, move forward on a Ar Northern Arctic policy framework to ensure that investments in infrastructure, investments in supports for the North, historic investments in food security, uh, in airline security, these are the things that matter for Canadians. Uh, before continuing, I just want to remind the honourable members that when there is heckling going back and forth, it really is hard on the interpreters' ears, and I'm sure nobody in this room wants to hurt the interpreters. The honourable member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is interfering in the judicial appointments process. Journalist Joël Denis Bellavance has evidence that in 2017, someone from the PMO contacted colleagues at the Justice Department at least four times to promote candidates. Four times, Mr. Speaker. Radio Canada has evidence that in 2019, someone from the, from the Minister of Justice's offer, office warned that he had concerns about PMO requirements prior to judicial appointments and even said that there was potential for a scandal there. So we know that the Prime Minister is interfering in the judicial appointment process. The million-dollar question is why the right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have strengthened the role of independent advisory committees. We have established a more rigorous, open and responsible process. We have merit-based accountable appointments, as well as on the needs of courts and the areas of expertise of each candidate. We are very proud of the highly competent jurists who have been appointed since our strengthened system was implemented. These appointments come from different political backgrounds. Due diligence occurs after the minister has made his recommendation, which occurs after the advisory committee has provided a list of names. The honorable member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, the prime minister hasn't answered, but we know why. The Prime Minister is interfering in the process in order to favor Liberal judges. His advisors are pressuring the Department of Justice. His ministers are consulted, like the Minister of Revenue in 2018. His MPs are consulted, like former member Nicolas Diorio. Rioting staff is consulted, like uh, Mi Minister of Agriculture staffers in 2018. The Prime Minister, ministers, MPs, staff, the entire Liberal machine is involved in judicial appointments. Mr. Speaker, has the Prime Minister invented a new concept, systemic favoritism? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, all of our judicial appointments are merit-based. We are proud of the highly competent experts who have been implemented since our strength and system was brought into place. And we have broadly consulted Due diligence takes place after the minister makes his recommendation, which is done after the advisory committee, which is independent, provides the list of names. For Calgary, Mindapur. Monsieur le Président, la nation demande... Mr. Speaker, the entire nation has recognized the importance of air companies. France gave $22.7 billion in grants and, sub and subsidies to the aerospace industry in France. As have done other countries, there have been loans, subsidies. We need to hear that the air industry is a priority. Mr. Speaker, when will this Liberal government take supporting the aerospace industry seriously? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know that Canadian workers and, all, and businesses of all, size, of all sizes are facing uncertainty during this pandemic. We will continue to analyze the specific difficulties caused by COVID-19 to industrial sectors who may be having unprecedented financial difficulties because of the pandemic. We have always supported... Leakage to the U.S. market is expected to grow as Canadians go to the U.S. for more inexpensive flights. When will the government provide the airline sector with a plan so that Canada won't continue to flail in the international market? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, allow me to begin by pointing out that 
We are in a historic pandemic right now, and we have put in measures in Canada designed to connect, protect Canadians. Uh, the members opposite, we've seen the Conservatives a few times saying we should follow the example of the Americans in how they're managing the pandemic. That is simply not what we are going to do. We stepped up with over $1.1 billion in support for Canada's airlines. We will continue to support them through this pandemic, through many of the measures we're even voting on a little later this week. These are the things that we're doing to both support our industries and keep Canadians safe, unlike what the Conservatives seem to want us to do. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Minnapur. Well, Mr. Speaker, finally this week, the government announced funding for the airline sector for only one region of Canada, leaving all other regions across Canada with reduced or eliminated service. Flights such as Fredericton to Halifax, Regina to Winnipeg, or North Bay to Toronto, all of which have been suspended. Other regions continue to wait for the government to act, wondering if their regional needs will ever be addressed. Is this what regions can continue to expect as a response for the struggling sector, or will the government finally come up with a national coordinated plan to help all regions of Canada? Well, Prime Minister. I suggest that the member opposite should actually listen to her colleague who asked a really important question about supports for northern regions uh, in this country. We actually moved forward, yes, earlier this week with extra supports for northern carriers because that's a region that is particularly hard hit by this pandemic and we will continue to ensure that northerners who rely on air, air uh, transportation to get food and basic supplies continue to be able to rely on that. We have been there for Canadians right across this country from the very beginning. We will continue to be there for Northerners and indeed for all Canadians, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Scarborough Centre. Mr. Speaker, last year, while Canadians were preparing themselves for the holidays, a then 10-year-old boy named Adam was wrongfully flagged as a possible security threat under the no-fly list. The Harper Conservatives, in a mad rush to promote themselves as tough, clumsily, designed a system whereby people were flagged based on nothing more than their name. This unfortunately led to very public instances whereby young children simply traveling to watch a hockey game were singled out. We have heard from groups such as the no-fly list kids that the conservatives' error must be addressed. Can the Prime Minister please inform the House when action will be taken to ensure no more children will be flagged falsely? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague from Scarborough Centre for the important question and for her advocacy on the file. After being alerted to troubling incidents involving children of members of the no-fly list kids, we assured concerned parents that we would work to prevent this from ever happening again. Today, I am pleased to announce that final provisions of the Secure Air Travel Act have come into force to deliver centralized screening and a Canadian travel number. We can all agree that 10-year-olds should not have to worry about being publicly singled out when trying to watch their favourite hockey team in action. The Honourable Member for Mission Matsky fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, over a year ago, the expert panel on money laundering in British Columbia estimated that over $40 billion is annually laundered in Canada. The panel also highlighted that there are serious federal gaps, specifically with FinTrack. This is a national problem requiring federal action. Canadian families are being priced out of certain real estate markets. So my question to the Prime Minister today, has FinTrack increased its reporting to law enforcement agencies, and what are the numbers? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we continue to work with the British Columbia and with all our partners on fighting organized crime and money laundering. Uh, this is an issue that, as the member opposite has said, uh, has impacts right across the country and in uh, various real estate markets particularly. Uh, that is why we've moved forward with the national housing strategy, increasing affordability for Canadians. We will continue to work with Canadians, even as we combat organized crime and money laundering, making housing more affordable, uh, making neighborhoods uh, stronger, and continuing to support Canadians through this pandemic and beyond. Well, member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Well, Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government has had five years to address this serious issue, which costs our country tens of billions of dollars a year and results in home ownership being out of reach for many Canadians. For every single full year that we were in power, we held a top 10 position in Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. This past year, Canada fell out of the top 10 for the first time since the last time the Liberals were in power. When is the Prime Minister going to show real leadership to solve this growing problem? Right. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I will highlight that unfortunately because the member opposite brought up uh, the Conservatives' time in office, I need to emphasize that they continue to cut resources for the RCMP to go after serious crimes like money laundering and organized crime. We made investments to support uh, our uh, frontline police officers. We made investments to enable the RCMP to do more. We're working in partnership with British Columbia. We are continuing to take very seriously uh, these matters and we'll continue to move forward on them. Member for Edmonton Wetaskiwin. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is stuck in the past, but the Transparency International report posted this year in 2020 is titled Canada Falls from Its Anti Corruption Perch. It highlights the SNC Lavalin scandal, saying, quote, countries usually take the biggest hit on the corruption perception index when the long festering corruption issues come to light in explosive ways. It continues, but this can also be the best time for officials to roll up their sleeves and finally tackle the problems. This Prime Minister has literally made an art form of rolling up his sleeves. When is he going to move on to actually tackling the growing problem of money laundering? Honourable Prime Minister. As I said, uh, after Conservatives cut investments into RCMP, FinTrack and CRA, we actually made $172 million in investments. So it's not just about rolling up our sleeves, it's about actually delivering for these agencies, whether it's the RCMP, FinTrack or the CRA, that can actually go after money laundering. Those are the investments we made tangibly when Conservatives made cuts. The Honourable Member for Dorval, La Chine, La Salle. Mr. Speaker, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy enabled workers in my riding of Dorval, La Chine, La Salle to continue having a paycheck to count on. However, initially, that support was slated to end at the end of the year. Could the Prime Minister tell this House what our government plans to do to ensure that workers can continue to count on this support as we face a second wave of the virus. Thank you very much. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for her important question on behalf of the, her uh, voters in Dorval, La Chine, La Salle. For more than 3.7 million Canadians, the wage subsidy provided provided job security while we were fighting COVID-19. With Bill C-9, our government seeks to extend the wage subsidy until June 2021 so that Canadian businesses be in a position of strength when we exit this crisis. I hope that all MPs will join us in supporting the extension of this important program. Honourable Member for Churchill Kuatnut Askey. Mr. Speaker, people are scared. After months of First Nations doing everything they can to stay safe, there is a COVID-19 outbreak at the Kiosk Work Camp, where there are hundreds of workers. Manitoba Hydro hasn't shut down the camp. They're not sharing information with First Nations, and there are concerns that they are using questionable testing techniques. This could put our entire region at risk. Will the Prime Minister intervene directly on behalf of First Nations and Northern people? Will he call for immediate action to stop the spread of COVID-19 at Kiosk and throughout our region. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are obviously concerned by the outbreak of COVID-19 cases at the Kiosk Generating Station, and we're monitoring the situation closely. We expect work on the Manitoba Hydro Project to follow public health advice to keep workers and Indigenous communities safe. We will support First Nations leadership in working with their partners on measures appropriate to protect their communities. That's all the time we have today. C'est tout le temps qu'on a.